and to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what he's saying. That's the foundation of the law. And we know that because that's exactly what Jesus said at the Last Supper. He said, I give you only one commandment. Love God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with your soul, all your mind and body. And love your neighbor as yourself. So we know that that is the foundation of our religion, our faith, our coming together and following Jesus. But he also, St. Paul also talks about how this can be destroyed through backbiting, rumoring, and criticizing, envy, and so forth. So there's ways in which that love that we're supposed to have and is the foundation of our life and our faith can be undermined. I always think about a couple who comes here infatuated and just in love with each other and enamored and they marry one another here at the altar. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. That's the commitment. But we know that in many marriages that commitment doesn't play out perfectly. Enter, enter certain selfishness, certain disrespect perhaps, maybe even conflict and abuse. And that's sad. That's my topic today, domestic violence. And you might say, well, why are we talking about that? It doesn't seem to be a big deal. But actually, domestic violence is rampant United States. The Centers for Disease Control says a woman is battered in this country every three seconds. It also says one out of every four women is either hit or sexually assaulted by her partner at some point in her life. One out of four. That's incredible. It makes us really wonder what, what is happening to us. In the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan, between the year 2000 and 2006, there were 3,200 Americans that died in those two wars. But in those same six years, three times that many women were murdered by their partners right here in the United States. More than 10,000. So we know it's a big problem. And it affects our young people, too. A study show recently that one out of every five girls between the ages of 11 and 17, one out of five has already been hit on a date. Imagine. That makes us concerned for our children, our grandchildren, our nieces. We want them to live love and peace. Of course, men are also victims of domestic violence, but they're a small minority among victims. Maybe out of 10 victims, one or a little more is a man. The studies aren't too good. So I'm speaking primarily about women today, but my intention is to include men as well. Now you might say, well, it doesn't happen here because we don't hear about it that much, right? It's a pretty secret kind of thing that goes on behind closed doors. But the police report in any district, and in fact in any suburb, even the most wealthy suburbs you can think of. If you go to the police and ask them, what's the number one most frequent 911 call you receive? They're going to say domestic violence. Whether you're in Lake Forest or Barrington, you know, where you're in the right south side of Orland Park, whether you're in the inner city, it doesn't make any difference. It's there everywhere. Now, some victims don't know they're victims. They might be just confused by what's happened. They live with a difficult man, they might make excuses for him, or they might tiptoe around so they don't set him off. Or maybe because they've never been hit, they think they're not a victim. But domestic violence is much broader than just physical abuse. Its definition is any pattern of behavior that seeks power and control over an intimate partner. And that power of control can be physical, but it can be verbal or emotional. It can be economic or sexual. 
I think we all know what physical abuse is, punching someone, slapping them, kicking them, pushing them, throwing things at them, all kinds of ways. Verbal or emotional abuse is more difficult to detect, but it's the most common form. There are no bruises, no broken bones, but many victims say it hurts more because it attacks the human spirit. All the insults, the constant criticism, the belittling, the foul words, the excessive jealousy, even the silent treatment. And economic abuse happens more than we might think. Uh -huh. Maybe she has a job, but she has to turn the money over and then receive a minimum uh, allowance, and he controls that. Or he has assets and she knows nothing about them. There are many different ways. And sexual abuse is perhaps more common these days than in previous years, largely because of the easy access to pornography and the internet. So some men will watch it and then oblige their wives to watch it. And most women find it disgusting. Or maybe it's forced intimacy or intimacy denied. Or maybe it's infidelity. Some people don't think anything about it. But that's also abuse. I'll tell you a story about a man who called me very insistently on a Friday afternoon. He wanted me to talk to him and his wife. I didn't have time that Friday, but we met in the chapel on Sunday after Mass. He said, Father, I want you to talk to my wife. She's always been unfaithful to me, looking at other men. But this week was the last week. I came home and I found the back door to our apartment. I knew there was a man in the house, Father. I went out to the backyard and I saw my neighbor by the alley. I said, hey, you see a guy back there? He said he thought he had. I know there was a man in our house, Father. Talk to him. So I asked him to step out. I said to him, has he always been this jealous with you? Oh, Father, we've been married 10 years. We have three children. And his, his jealousy just got worse. Well, when you were dating him, was he jealous then? Oh, yes, he was. I said, well, why did you marry him? Well, I thought, once we got together day and night, jealousy would disappear, but it hasn't. I said, that's because it's not jealousy. This is his way of making you feel very insecure, very uncertain. He gets into your mind so that everything you do, you're always thinking, what will he say? How will he react? Let me ask you, I said, does he hit you? Well, not recently, she said. I said, well, when was the last time? About three months ago. Does he use bad words on you? Oh, Father, they're so terrible, I can't even repeat them to you. Well, do we have a job and have some income? Well, I had a good job, but he made me quit. He accused me of hanging out with the men at the plant, so I had to leave it. So do you have money now to manage the household? Father, I have to plead, plead for every penny just to buy clothing for the children or food for the table. Well, how does he treat you sexually, I said. Well, he said, she said, well, when he wants to be affectionate, he can be. So I asked her to please step out, and uh, he came back in, and I confronted him about this, and he surprised me because he admitted quite a bit, not everything, but enough so that I could invite him into our parish program for men who abuse their wives, so he would confront his behavior and make changes. And I invited her into our parish program for women who are abused, so she would understand the dynamics of domestic violence and have the strength to resist it. This is just one case, and every case is different, but it gives us an idea. Now the good news about domestic violence is that it is learned behavior. It's not something we inherit in our genes. We learn it from someplace. Maybe our parents, culture, the media, and maybe trial and error. And that means it can be unlearned, new ways of relating to 
to one's spouse can be blurred. But men and women who abuse their spouses, they don't change easily. They're into a lot of denial, a lot of self-justification. You know, she needs this, I, I have to do this to correct her. They don't understand. Or maybe they make excuses like, well, I was just drinking a little too much. Or, you know, I'm under a lot of stress. Uh, and that's what it is. I don't have a job. But these reasons don't explain domestic violence. They might aggravate it. But the cause is a decision to exercise power and control over an intimate partner. There are plenty of alcoholics who don't abuse their spouses. And there are plenty of people who don't drink. And they do abuse their spouses. So drinking and abuse are two separate problems, but they can aggravate one another. Now sometimes there's an explosion. I mean, she may end up in the emergency room. Or, or maybe it's a yelling match after which he knows he's gone too far, and she may leave, and he doesn't want that. So he's going to come and say, I'm sorry. I don't know what got into me. Please forgive me. I'll never do it again. So she has to decide, should I forgive him? She's a Christian. She believes in forgiveness. She wants to keep the family together, so she forgives him. And he seems to have changed. This is wonderful. It's like a honeymoon. I mean, he's bringing flowers. He's helping out in the house. Everything's great. But gradually, tensions begin again until there's another explosion, followed by more remorse and more requests for forgiveness. And she's challenged once again, do I forgive him this time too? I've known women who have lived in this cycle of domestic violence for more than 25 years. And each time their husband says, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again, they think, well, maybe this time he'll come through. But many don't. They don't change. Some change, but many don't. Many of you have seen the movie, What's Love Got to Do With It? With Ike and Tina Turner. And Ike is brutal to her, drags her down the hallway by her hair. And then later that night, he comes through the sliding doors of her bedroom and lays Moses down next to her battered body, trying to make up for it. And he and she lived that cycle of domestic violence. Now we might say, why doesn't she just get up and leave? She doesn't have to stay. But that's not easy, too. There are many reasons why victims stay. One obvious reason is financial. I mean, she'd have a job, but if she's supporting the family alone, that might be too much. She doesn't have that kind of income. So she might just wait it out until the children are grown. Or maybe she stays because She's too embarrassed. She's never told anybody. And if she leaves, people will find out. And she's feeling guilty. I mean, after all, she chose it, and she can't fix it. So she's embarrassed by it. Better to stay quiet. Maybe her father told her, you marry that guy? Don't come back here. You know, you made your bed, you have to lay on it. So she has to stay. Some victims stay because they've internalized the abuse. Imagine hearing every day, you're so stupid. You don't know how to do anything. Everything you touch is a disaster. And look at you, you're fat, you're ugly. Nobody's going to want you. You have to stay with me. And she believes it. Her self-esteem is on the floor. She's walking around half depressed. She doesn't have the strength to separate. Some victims stay because they're afraid. He may have told you, not, you, you, you leave me, and you'll pay for it. You'll see. And she knows he's a violent man. He may have a gun in the house. You know, he may have said, you leave me, and I'll kill you. Or I'll kill the children. And she knows it happens. She sees the news. So she stays out of fear. Some victims stay because they see that their children love their fathers. And the men might be pretty good dads. You know, they, they know how to take care of the kids and keep them close. 
Because if the children are close to them, their wives will never leave. The children will say, Mommy, Mommy, we don't want to leave Daddy. And the mothers won't have the heart to tear the children away from their dads. But I would say to women like this, what is one of the worst things a, a mother can do? It's to have her children growing up in that environment where they're learning about abuse and violence. Children who grow up in homes where there's domestic violence are five times more likely to become abusers or victims, drop out of school, end up in jail, or attempt suicide. It's very risky to grow up in that kind of family. Finally, many victims stay because they made a promise right here at the altar, before God, that they would stay in that relationship until death. And they don't want to commit a sin. They don't want to offend God. So they think they have to stay. But I was say, can you imagine Jesus walking down the street one day, and he comes across a woman with a black eye, her arm is in a sling, and he says, what happened to you? And she says, well, my husband beat me. What do you think Jesus would say? Would he say, you got to go back to him and work it out? Or would he say, come with me and I will help you be saved? I think that's what he would say. And that's what we have to say as the church of Jesus Christ. Come to us and we will help you be saved. That's our goal. Unfortunately, our church has been a little complicit in this because we've not said very much about it. How many of you have ever heard a sermon about domestic violence? Raise your hand. One, two, three. No. I've been a priest for over 55 years, and more than half of those years, I didn't preach about it. I didn't say anything. Until I hired a, a social worker on my staff, and she told me, you know, Father, almost all my clients are women, and most of them are victims of domestic violence. I had no idea. And I knew many of those women, but I didn't see the problem. She opened my eyes to this, and that's what we have to do. Now the good news is that our bishops in the United States have written a beautiful pastoral letter about domestic violence. It is called, When I Call for Help. You can Google that, put it in your computer, When I Call for Help, it comes up. It's not a real long letter. It's a beautiful letter. In the first paragraph, the bishops say, we have to state as strongly and clearly as we can that violence against women inside or outside the home is never justified. And it is a sin and often a crime. And then they conclude the letter saying, we emphasize that no one is expected to stay in an abusive marriage. Those are words of liberation for many women and some men. No one is expected to stay in an abusive marriage. That's the position of the Catholic Church, and many people don't know it. So we have to get the word out and help people find the freedom and the love they need in their lives. I'm the Director of Domestic Violence Outreach for the Archdiocese of Chicago, and I've been to over 175 parishes preaching about this and, um, and forming a ministry. So Father Bob has asked me to come back on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock at the Tolton Center. And uh, for anybody who would like to come and talk more about this, learn more about it, or help your parish here respond more compassionately and effectively in your community, we'll talk about it. So 7 o'clock at the Tolton Center. If you can't make it, but want to be involved with us as we develop this ministry, you can sign up at the usher's table outside and we will contact you for the second meeting. And if you'd like to make a donation, there's a basket out there for donations because this ministry is volunteer. I, I'm a retired priest. I don't get paid. Nobody gets paid in our organization. We're all volunteers. And we, we don't get any money from the archdiocese, even though they recognize us as a ministry in the diocese. So thank you for your support. But wouldn't it be wonderful 
If everybody in this community knew, you have a problem in your relationship, go to Our Lady of Africa, because there they understand. There they will help you. There you will find the compassion of Jesus. That's what we want. We want to become the compassionate hands and heart of Jesus Christ for those who are suffering abuse in their homes. May God help us. Let the people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, loving God, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, who plays our bishop, and all the faithful. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Throw him, wind him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty God, forever and ever. Takes away the sins of 
the world. Bless thou me of coming to the table of the Lord. Lord, Lord May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus keep us now.
picture of Peter's Pence, which is the uh, fund that goes to Pope Francis for his charitable giving.
which we have offered and received. Fill us with life, so that bound to you in lasting love, we may bear fruit that lasts forever. And this we pray in Christ our Lord. Amen. There are a few announcements. Today, here in our parish hall, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and past one is it, uh, free COVID shots are available from the city of Chicago. COVID testing with any insurance you have. Bible study will take place down in the parish hall, June 29th, Wednesday at 11 a.m. As Father mentioned earlier, Meeting on a meeting on domestic violence on Tuesday at 7 p.m. will take place at the Totem Center on 41st in Michigan. Ella Crossley of our parish passed away Friday. She is the mother of Sharon Crossley Neal, one of our parishioners. Arrangements. Our pen. Also, we found this information out just a few minutes ago. Simone Green, Bob Harris, passed away last Thursday. She is the wife of Charles Green of our parish. <coughs> Those arrangements are pending. Please keep both families in your prayers. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for allowing me to come here today and celebrate these sacred mysteries for you. I feel, I feel it's a great privilege to be with you and celebrate, and I want to thank the choir, the musicians, all the ministers who participated today, the ushers, and all of you who came to celebrate our faith, to give praise and glory to God and to commit ourselves to live the life of Jesus and to do his works so that people can see in us individually and in our parish, Jesus Christ lives and is serving everyone. May God bless us and watch over us. The Lord be with you. May the peace and blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with us forever. Amen. Let us go in peace. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord.